morning we are uh, continuing in our series in 1 Corinthians. Uh, this series will take us all the way through almost the end of the year until the end of November. Um, but instead of just having this be one series, we've broken this into, a, into several different parts. Um, this one is, uh, is called Come Together, this first four chapters here. Yes, it is like the Beatles song. Um, and it's all about unity within the church and how, we, um, how we're supposed to relate to one another and, and what this whole thing of following Jesus is supposed to look like. Because there, Paul's writing this letter to, um, to these, these believers, primarily Gentiles, not Jews, um, in the city of Corinth, located in ancient Greece. Um, and he's, he's teaching them and, and showing them and, and reminding them what it means to, to live a life that's honoring to the Lord, to what it means to live a life um, that... that as the scriptures say, we are a new creation. What, is that, what does that look like? How are we supposed to do this thing? And there's a, there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. Um, and I think that uh, these Corinthians, I, I'm choosing to believe that they were, um, their heart was in the right place, even though they maybe uh, didn't do things exactly the right way, or at least the way that they they should have. So we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 while you're turning there. Um, uh, a brief little story here. I, so last summer, we, built a, we decided we were going to build a shed in our, in our backyard. Um, we're, we're in the city of Oshkosh, and so as I'm thinking about uh, building this shed, I, I decided, you know, I probably need to call the inspector's office and just see, like, what is the criteria? Like, how do we do this thing? And so I called him. And, uh, and I said, hey, we're going to put up this shed. Is this something that I need to pull a permit for? Or what, what do I need to make sure that I do? And he said, well, um, yeah, it's something you need to pull a permit for. And so um, trying to understand how the, the whole thing works, I said, okay, well, um, we, we, what if I were to put up like a, a playhouse for my kids? Like would I need to pull a permit for that? And he said, no, because that's primarily recreational. And I said, okay, um, what if I were to build a playhouse for my kids and store Christmas decorations in it. Like, is that, what, what about that? He said, well, that's kind of a gray area. Um, if you're primarily going to use it for storage purposes, then we would label it as a shed, and you do need to pull a permit for that. So then I had a decision to make. I had a decision to make, friends. I do I, do I pull the permit and, and do this thing like cross the T's and dot the I's or do I, do I not pull the permit and say, well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a shed per se um, and my kids do play in it once in a while. And so anyway, after I was talking to my wife, Anna, about it and we said, well, okay, let's just pull the permit. We'll pay the whatever the fee is. Do this thing the right way um, because... As we were talking about it, I was like, I, I can't, in, in good conscience, I can't build this thing and not do it the right way. Like, I just, I just can't do it. Um, and that's not to say, to toot my own horn or to say that I do everything perfectly all the time, although I am a pastor, and so I suppose I do. Um, <clears throat> just kidding, I certainly don't. Um, but there's a, there was a way for me to do this that was right, and there was a way that was sort of right, sort of kind of right, but really not all that right at all. My heart was in the right place, um, but there's a way to do it and to build in a, I, I had to decide whether I was going to build this shed in a better way or whether or not I was going to just kind of skate by underneath the radar. And that's kind of where these, these Corinthians aren't building a shed necessarily. Maybe they were, but not in this particular passage. But they are building a church. They're building a, a group of people, a community, and there's a right way for them to do that and a wrong way for them to do that. And that's what Paul is talking about here um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so let's start in, uh, in verse 1 here. So he says, but I, brothers, Paul talking to these, these people in Corinth, I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not, even, not solid food, for you weren't ready for it. And even now you're not ready for it, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving in only a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely being human? And so he's, he comes out here and he, he softens the blow that he's about to give to these Corinthians by saying, brothers. Because he's reminding them that, that he knows them. 
right? Because Paul spent about a year and a half with them um, as he's planting this church. Um, and then he, he left, um, and he planted a church in Ephesus, and he left this, this man named Apollos um, in charge and, and continuing to help build the church. Um, and this is about five years later, approximately, since Paul left, he's writing this first letter to them, and he's saying, brothers, when I first came to you, you, do, you knew nothing. You knew absolutely nothing about God, nothing about the gospel. And so I fed you milk because that's what you do with babies. You feed them milk. Like, you don't give them a steak right out of the womb. That's just not the way that works. And, and so like Pastor Allen talked about last week, the, the basics. He taught them the basics. He taught them about who God was, that he is he's three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, that um, he is uh, that, that Jesus is God incarnate that came and, and dwelt among us and was crucified in our place and raised three days later. Alan talked about the, Pastor Alan talked about the, the centrality of the cross last week and how we have to get the basics right. We have to get the basics right before we jump ahead to anything more advanced. And that was really the problem that these, that these Corinthians had. They, had. they had jumped ahead much farther than they should have because they hadn't really even gotten the basics done. And so he says, when I first came to you, I fed you with milk, because that's what you needed, and I'm still feeding you milk, because that's still what you need. Five years later, and so the image is really of a, a five-year-old breastfeeding. Is the image that, and so the, these Corinthians are kind of like, this is, it's like, it's like semi, semi-insulting, Paul. What are you trying to say about me right now, because, and another part of this is that they think they're so mature and wise, because in the city of Corinth, they, they were proud of their intellectual snobbery. They talked about the, the finer things in life, and the, um, the, the really deep part of what it means to be a human being. Let's grab a coffee, and let's talk about what it means to be human. And so they would talk about all these, these deep things, and when Paul says, listen, you got no idea what's going on here, You're still, you should still be eating milk. It's, it's kind of insulting to them, but he's, he's reminding them that, like, you don't have this whole thing all figured out. You understand all of these deep concepts, and you debate about all of these things, but you're just infants. I know you're infants because of the way that you're acting. If you were as mature as you think you are, you wouldn't be having these disagreements and these arguments. And he says that they are people of the flesh. Now, when we read the word flesh, when, when you first read it, it's like, um, I'm a person of flesh. I have meat and skin on bones. Is there a different type of person that I'm unaware of? Um, and he... Yes, there's on one level when he says flesh, it's meat and bones and body and physical form. But on another level, he's, he uses the Greek word, the root Greek word sarx, S-A-R-X. So you spell that. And the idea here is that it's this um, physical, but it's also this sinful human nature. Now, not that those things always go together. Physical doesn't always mean sinful. But He's saying that it's the sinful human nature. And then he says, your people of the flesh, your people who are still combating this old sinful nature, you're not spiritual people. And when we think about spiritual, we think like, we think non-physical. We think like doing yoga and like prayer and worship and like meaning of life type stuff, like that, that soul care, that soul health, being, being peaceful in your soul. And while on one hand, that's certainly true, that's not what Paul means here. When he says spiritual, he means of the Spirit, as in like of the Holy Spirit. So he says, your people that are marked by, by flesh, by sin, by that sarks, you're not spiritual people. You're not people of the Spirit. Now, it's not a salvation thing. He's simply saying, you're not acting like a Christian. You're not acting like Jesus. You're acting like a sinful person. And so one of the first things that we can learn from this is that spiritual maturity isn't necessarily how much you know, but how you conduct yourself. Maybe that's a better gauge 
of how spiritually mature you are is how you conduct yourself. Because these Corinthians knew a lot. They talked about a lot of different things. They debated a lot of different things, but they had the maturity of an infant. You're still being worldly. And as he points out, it's because of the factions that were starting to form within this church. I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. And then they would argue about it. Because in, in the ancient city of Corinth, if you wanted to have fun, you didn't go see a movie because movies weren't around yet. You don't go watch Netflix because there were no screens. You don't go for a drive because cars hadn't been invented yet. But no, if, if you want to have fun in the city of Corinth, one of the ways to have fun is you would go see a sophist speak, a philosopher speak, or you would go and see a sophist debate. Now, a sophist is a, a, a philosopher who would, would debate for entertainment. And so, they, and because this was a fun experience for these citizens of Corinth, these sophists made a lot of money. They made a lot of money, to, and they would charge people to come and listen to their, their grand oration skills and the, the arguments that they would put together and the way that they would debate with these other philosophers, these other sophists. And the way that these philosophers interacted after a period of time, they, um, because there was so much money in it, they, they started to, to grab disciples. And there were these people who come and say, hey, I want to learn how to do this from you. Will you teach me? And they would say, yes, I'll teach you how to do this. And they would bring them along as a disciple. Well, these disciples of the sophists would start fighting with the other disciples of other sophists. And there would, they would slander the other opponent, and they would debate, and they would degrade the other opponent. Think like, think like Winnicani Amro football, like times a million. Like, th there were brawls in the streets at times between these two groups, or three groups. Sometimes it even went as far as that someone was murdered because of an argument that arose between the disciples of these particular philosophers. And the Corinthians took this idea from their city, from their culture, and they did that within the church. So Paul, is, he comes to the Corinthians, and he, he plants this church. He starts to talk to them what it, what it means to follow Jesus, and they, they give their life to Christ, and they have they've become a new creation. They're following after him, and then Paul leaves, and then Apollos comes in. And then Peter, Cephas, comes in for a while, too, and he's there, and and so then you start to see these factions start to form around these different leaders, just like it would with the philosophers of the day, the sophists of the day. And so when people are saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, it's, it's different from you saying, hey, I really like the way that uh, Alan teaches better than the, I like the way that you teach, Joe. No offense, but I like that differently. And honestly, like, Alan's my favorite too. It's okay. We're fine with this. <clears throat> but he, they're acting just like the sophists. They're acting, acting just like the philo philosophers. He's saying, aren't you just being worldly? You think you're so spiritual because you're talking about these high and lofty things, but you're not being like Jesus. You're being like these philosophers. Your way of thinking and your actions isn't being molded by Jesus. It's being molded by these pagan philosophers. So Paul continues, to, and he corrects this idea in their actions and explains what is at stake with this. So he continues in verse 5. He says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who planted nor he who waters is anything, but, who, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wage according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. What is Paul? What is Apollos? So he says, there's all these factions, and you're saying, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. Well, what is Paul? What is Apollos? It's an interesting way to frame that question. You would think you would say, well, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? 
But what he's doing when he asks, what is Paul or what is Apollos? He is, he's, he's focusing on the function of the teacher or the leader, not the teacher himself. Because that's what the, the philosophers would focus themselves and, and rally around the person of that philosopher. And so instead of making this about the person, he makes it about the function, the thing that they would do. So Paul came and he planted, and then Apollos came and he watered, but God was the one who made this whole thing grow. Paul and Apollos were simply instruments through which God did his work, because God works through people who work. And what's so interesting is that he's saying, like, were you... Paul is saying, Apollos and I are united in this. Like, we're on the same page. There's no strife between he and I. Why is there strife between you? That's inevitably what he's getting to here. The people that you're following don't want you to act like this, so why are you acting like this? We're united. Why aren't you united? If this is a monkey see, monkey do type thing, then, like, be united like, like we are. So then he continues on in in, uh, verses 10 through 15, and he talks about God's building. He talks about different ways to build. He says that, um, let each one care how he builds upon the foundation, of which is Jesus. Let each one take care how he builds. You can build with, with gold and silver and precious stones, which harkens back to Solomon's temple in ancient Israel, or you can build with wood and hay and straw. And the idea is here, you can, you can either build in a Jesus sort of way, or you can build in a non-Jesus sort of way, in a sinful sort of way. And then he says, when the, when the day comes, and in my Bible it's a capital D day, and that's a, a reference to the day of the Lord. When Jesus returns and we stand before him, we will give an account of what we've done. And not just what we've done, but how we've done it. So he's telling these these Corinthians that you're going to stand before Jesus when all of the sin is removed from the world. If the work that you have done was sinful, that will be removed too. If you have done that work, whatever it is, if you have done it in a sinful way, that work will be removed too. It's not about salvation, certainly not. He's not saying that these people are going to go to hell because they've done things in a sinful way. He says if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. And it's this idea from the first part of the chapter that you can do things in the power of the spirit or in the power of the flesh. As a spiritual person or as a person of the flesh, that Sark's idea. Work that we do in the power of the Spirit or as spiritual people will be rewarded, but work that we do in the power of the flesh will not. He continues on in in verse 16 and 17. He says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him because God's temple is holy. And you, when he says you are God's temple, it's a, it's a y'all are God's temple. It's not a you individual in this passage. Now we know from other parts of scripture that you as an individual, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a temple of God. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you as an individual. What he's saying here is that we together are a temple of God. That we together are holy. So it's a, it's a subtle rebuke to the leaders and the key influencers within the church saying, listen, you're letting this happen. Worse, you're instigating this. You're, you're not just letting this happen, you're making this happen. You're taking this template of the philosophers from your surrounding culture, and you're doing that within the church, and that's not the way of Jesus. The type of jealousy and strife that you are bringing into the church is not of God. It's a rebuke to the congregation saying, you are holy, and you're building something holy, and you're building it in an unholy way.
They're building something holy. They're building this church, and they're building it in an unholy way. So he's saying, don't build this like the sophists. Don't build this like those philosophers. You can. You certainly can build it that way, but you shouldn't do that because that's not the way of Jesus. They're building in the wisdom of the world when you should be building like Christ in the wisdom and power of the Spirit. We get an idea of what this looks like in Galatians chapter 5 when he's talking about how, what the fruit of the Spirit is. When you are following after the Spirit, when you are letting him lead you in how you should conduct yourself, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Corinthian, Corinthians were doing the right thing the wrong way. They, they were building the church. They were, they were bringing the gospel to their neighbors. They were praying for one another. They were supporting one another. But they were doing it the wrong way. And so the, the real idea that we can pull away from this is don't be like the Corinthians. Don't do right things the wrong way. And I think, I think most of us have a general understanding of that. That like, it's not okay to have an affair. It's not okay to go and steal a car. Like we have a general understanding that like, these are things that are not appropriate, especially for those of us who are followers of Jesus and sons and daughters of his. Like we know that we're not supposed to do those things, but there's maybe with some of the smaller things, or some of the more complicated things where it gets a little, a little dicey. I think that we're, we're well-intentioned, so I think our heart is in the right place when we say, like, I have a responsibility, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it well, and then we end up doing it wrong. So let me, give you, let me give you an example. Maybe this is a really easy one, but we know that as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be a generous people. We're supposed to be generous. And so we hear that and we say, I want to be as generous as I possibly can. So I'm not going to pay my taxes so I can be more generous. Easy one, right? But you get, the, you get that idea. You, you want to do the right thing, but you're doing it in the wrong way. What about, so I need to, I need to provide for my family. I need to work hard. And I do, I work really hard, and I provide for my family. My family has a, we have a good life. But I'm not really ever around. So functionally, I've abandoned my family in the pursuit of providing for them. It's a, it's a sin of virtue. We want to do the right thing. We're trying to do the right thing, but we do it in the wrong way. Or maybe another one, if you're, you're in your community group and you're talking about um, prayer requests and you're sharing prayer requests and you say, hey, we really need to pray for this person. We're going through a really hard time. Um, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. You want people to pray for them, but you've just gossiped about that person. doing the right things the wrong way. These Corinthians were building this church. They were winning people to Christ, and they were doing it in a very wrong way. You're here, and so you are building this with us. You are building this church with us. I'm not talking about brick and mortar. I'm talking about this community. You're building this community with us. We need to make sure we're doing this in the right way. We're going to have disagreements. It happens. You get two people in a room and there's disagreements. Sometimes when I'm by myself, I have disagreements with myself. Like this is just part of being human. But there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. But what are you building? At least since you're here and you're breathing, you are building your life. I don't know what all your life entails, if it's a career, 
It's a business, family, community group, any combination of, of those things. But I think as, as Americans, we get, we're so obsessed with output. We're so obsessed with producing something. We want to do things as quickly and efficiently as we can. But we can't get so focused on what we're doing and what we're trying to build that we don't think about how we're building it. We need to build in a better way. We need to build by the, by the power of the Spirit, not by the power of the flesh. So what are you building? Invite the worship team up. They're going to lead us in a few last songs here. I've got a few questions for us to think about before we, we sing this last song together. What are the things that you are building? What are the things that you are working towards? What has God given you responsibility for? What are you building? Are you building it in the power of the Spirit as a spiritual person or as a person of the flesh? in a sinful way. And if you're building things in the power of the flesh, you're just like, yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I think that's me. What can you do to, to work towards building in the power of the Spirit? If you're saying, you know, Joe, I think that I, Generally speaking, I think that I, I'm doing this well. Um, I'm generally a, a patient person, like my friend Zach here. I'm kind, and I, I'm, I'm trying to do this as best I can and, and do this in a Jesus-honoring way. How can you continue to do that? What can you do to continue to build in the power of the Spirit? God doesn't just care about what we do. He cares about how we do.